FBI crime statistics that have just come out. Um, I believe they came out yesterday, if not two days. Actually, they came out on the 26th. Uh, so homicides in the United States went up by more than 10% in 2015, um, over the year before. So over 2014, we went up by 10%. Violent crime increased by nearly 4% during the same period. Uh, and this is the new stats that have been released by the FBI. They were just released on Monday. Um, 50% of the homicides took place in just seven U.S. cities. Not only that, but a vast majority of those new homicides, out of what, 1,400 new homicides? I'm looking for that number. Um, the vast majority of them were African Americans, were blacks. Um, 800. 800 out of like 1,400. 15. 800 out of 1,500 were African Americans. All right, so here, here are the data. So the percentage of murders committed with guns increased to 71.5%. Uh, in 2015, there was an estimate of 372 uh, violent crimes per 100,000 residents. In 1995, there was an estimated 685 uh, violent crimes per 100,000 uh, residents. So overall, overall, it's dramatically lower. However, there has been an increase from this from last year, from 2014 to 2015. Now, in context, this is important because if you remember at the debate, uh, Donald Trump was important for a lot of reasons. But the reason it's on the radar right now is because Donald Trump actually tried to allude to this as a justification for stop and frisk, uh, particularly in New York. He identified New York as one of the cities that had an uptick in murders, but that's not the case in New York, uh, but Chicago, uh, St. Louis, and a couple of other cities, seven cities actually account for the majority of the increase. Um, so um, speaking to uh, Loretta Lynch, the attorney, uh, U.S. Attorney General, um, speaking at a violence prevention conference in Arkansas said, quote, despite an overall increase in violent crime, 2015 still represented the third lowest year for violent crime in the past two decades. So we're seeing, in a way, um, the best of times and the worst of times, if I could be so coy as to reference that. But for a lot of African Americans across the country, this is a dangerous time. Um, it's not what Donald Trump described, but he's not absolutely wrong. What he is wrong about in terms of the African-American experience is that he has not painted a complete picture, nor is he willing to paint a complete picture. Um, Democrats really aren't interested in painting the picture at all. To be fair to this conversation, um, they're not going to talk about the plight of African-Americans because the plight of African-Americans in many of these cities are Democratic cities. But for them to identify the real problem underneath it, not only would they have to identify that this is happening in Democratic cities, but it's also happening because of not just the treatment of the Democratic Party, but the economic paradigm that the D Democratic Party subscribes to. And above all else, they're not going to undermine that. Right. So nobody is going to paint the complete picture of what's happening in these black communities where murder is out of control, while in the rest of the United States, murder's going down. It's insane. It's insane. Um, but I was um, I got introduced to uh, a, a researcher, a journalist named Emily um, Bazelon. Close enough. We'll go with that. Um, of the New York Times and Slate. Uh, and she did something that I think is definitely worthwhile us taking a look at. She was talking about it on a podcast uh, that we were listening to, and she actually took a look at a map of murders in, sh in the Chicago area, the greater Chicago area, um, and the incidents of lead poisoning in the same area um, and there was one more map, um, not only lead poisoning, but the what? Oh, segregation. Like she, if you overlay those maps of murder rates in the greater Chicago area, segregation in the greater Chicago area, and incidents of lead poisoning in the greater Chicago area, you can see that if someone does actual data on it, there's going to be a high correlation between those incidences. 
I want to repeat that again so that people can actually hear. Uh, and then I'm going to show you the, the maps, and then we're going to expand on it a little bit. So with just the eye test, if you look at, and you can actually go to the, the one particular neighborhood, and you can see in Chicago, you can see in this, great, in this greater Chicago area, you can see high concentrations of murder, along with high levels of seg segregation, along with high levels of lead, incidents of lead poisoning. And she stopped there, which was a great analysis and gave us the idea to go one step further and to look at the levels of poverty in those areas. And just looking at it, you can see where you find high levels of murder, you find high levels of segregation, high incidences of lead poisoning, and high levels of segregation. I think it says segregation first, but you also find high incidences of poverty. Politicians, particularly Donald Trump, wants to point at this as being this is just something that uh, we need stop and frisk because we have to basically translation. We need to cage these animals. We need to get guns out of their hands because they're violent offenders. And this is the problem. And this is the solution. Right. Democrats aren't even talking about the problem in a substantive way because it's going to require them to talk about the real problem. But no one is digging down to the fact that the correlation between poverty and crime is so clear and has been historically documented that you cannot talk about the murder rates in these cities unless you talk about the economic plight of the people in these cities and the treatment of the people in these cities. All right. So uh, just to just to demonstrate this a little clearer, I want to pull up a couple of maps so that you can see. Um, see it for yourself. All right. So I'm pulling this up on your screen and I apologize to those who are uh, listening via the radio. I will do my best to uh, describe it um, to the best of my ability. Um, so all right, here we go. All right. So the first graph we're looking at in the dark blue regions, uh, in the blue spots that you see across the map, those are um, incidents of homicides. Those where the homicides occur in Chicago. All right. Um, if you look at the westernmost area of Chicago um, and you can't see it right now, but the name of the area is called Austin. It's a neighborhood called Austin. And you'll see it on the far left hand side, the far western side. You see it's completely dark blue and you see it's scattered and littered with images uh, with blue dots that represent the homicides. All right. That's the first graph. If you look at the next graph, this image is of predominantly African-American community areas, right? So area 25, that's Austin. That's the same neighborhood. Now you can go back and forth. You can toggle back and forth. And just with the eye test, you can see down in the southern part of Chicago, you can see a lot of incidents of incidences of, um, of um, homicides and then toggle over and you see that those are predominantly black neighborhoods, right? Nothing groundbreaking there except black neighborhoods. The fact that we can call it a black neighborhood lets you know that there are high levels of segregation. All right. So we're going to go one step further. Now, this is all what uh, Emily uh, Bazelon, and I apologize if I pronounce your name wrong, but this is what she established. And if you look at this graph, this third graph is uh, our incidents of lead poisoning. These are occurrences of lead poisoning. Now, in particular, I want you to look at that same left hand west side of Chicago area. And I'm going to toggle back to the very first image. It's almost perfectly overlaid. Austin, where you have the highest concentrations of killings in Chicago. You also have high occurrences of lead poisoning. Now, this last graphic is not as clear because I guess Google does something different than everybody else does with their graphs, but you can see in the dark maroon areas, those are high levels of poverty. That Western corridor, that Western side, Austin, where you have high incidents, high occurrences rather of murders. You also have high levels of segregation. You also have high levels or high occurrences of lead poisoning. And you also have, a lot of poverty and that's just on the west side you can see the same graphics you can see the same occurrences on the south side of chicago lead poisoning 
poverty, segregation, murders. No one is going to talk about the fact that all of this that is going on is directly connected to the economic conditions of the black community. Donald Trump will say, oh, black people are poor, but he's not going to say why they are poor beyond the fact that what standard Republican orthodoxy suggests that black people are lazy. He's not going to talk about the occurrences of lead poisoning. He's not going to talk about the blithe. He's not going to talk about the white flight, the segregation. He's not going to talk about all of those things. Republicans will never talk about those things. But hell, we can't even get Democrats to talk about it in the first place. There's nothing else to really be said about this other than as long as we allow the conversations to end at murder, we will always allow them to vilify us and make it seem as though black people are inherently violent. Therefore, we need a national stop and frisk policy on communities of color. Right. And they will never go to the fact that these communities have been so devastated and decimated by neoliberal economic, by capitalism. So I'm tired of just saying neoliberal. It's a structural problem. It is the deindustrialization. It is the economic flight. It is the redlining. It is the underfunding of the war on poverty. So where you created homes originally in the 60s, you defunded it and allowed them to devolve into ghettos. But they blame they blame this on the war on poverty, saying by by creating the war on poverty here, we created we created the ghettos. No, the war on poverty didn't create the ghettos. It was the improper funding of the war on poverty. It was the 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 all of the stages from the time LBJ signed it to the time of welfare reform, where we gutted it even further. It's 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 a it was designed. No, let me rephrase that. It wasn't designed to create the ghettos, but opposition to it made sure that it was not properly funded and created a ghetto, a system that cycles and recycles and repeats itself over and over again. So that that grandmother who was there in the 60s had a daughter who was in poverty, that daughter who grew up in poverty. She had a daughter who was in poverty and it passed down from generation to generation and where you have poverty where you have poverty and blight, where you have poverty and mistreatment of by the people and by the police department and by public officials and politicians, you will have violent crimes. And while all these other neighborhoods are becoming, are, are getting nicer, getting safer, you have these predominantly black neighborhoods who are not, who are segregated, who are, who are experiencing high levels of, lead poisoning who who high levels of of poverty you're going to find these types of murders but again we're not going to talk about that